Good morning and welcome to today's STS 134 mission status briefing. Uh, we're here with Derek Hassman, the uh, lead flight director for the mission, and uh, we'll start off with comments from Derek and then move on to our questions from reporters. Derek? Okay, thanks Kelly and good morning everyone. Good to be here again today, um, wrapping up another busy on a uh, busy day on the on the space station, the shuttle Endeavor. Um, one of the reasons we added the extra extension days to the mission was to uh, work on station and and get ahead tasks that would put us in the best position uh, for both the uh, the stage and then STS-135 coming up in July. And one one of the critical items that we wanted to get repaired that I've talked to, talked about in previous briefings is the carbon dioxide removal assembly or CEDRA. And it's a piece of hardware that wasn't necessarily um, uh, engineered or designed to be repaired on orbit, but over the last several years, we've had a number of different issues with the unit, and uh, we've come a long way in terms of our ability to, to repair Cedron on orbit. You probably saw some of the, the great video that um, the crew downlinked from uh, the gym module where they were, at, they were doing the actual repairs. Um, and it kind of gives you a feel for the complexity and just the, uh, the access challenges that the, that the crew has with the number of valves and tubing and the, the thick insulation, et cetera. So uh, Spanky and Taz, uh, Mike Fink and, and Greg Shamatov, uh, we're working on the carbon dioxide removal assembly most of the day. Um, when I left Mission Control, they were a little bit behind. Uh, we were going to see where they were going to get uh, before they called it a night and then potentially uh, rescheduled additional time tomorrow for them to finish out that work. But uh, as we discussed before, the goal is to change out one of the two uh, cartridges or, or beds that remove CO2 in that Node 3 carbon dioxide removal assembly, uh, put, a, put a new bed in there, and then get the entire unit installed back into its, uh, to its home in the Node 3 uh, module. So we we're probably an hour or so away from finishing that when I left, and uh, my expectation is that uh, when I come on ship tomorrow, we'll have that seizure work done. So that's another big uh, objective behind us. Um, in addition to the seizure work, uh, both crews continued on uh, on their uh, transfer work, moving items uh, back and forth from uh, shuttle to station. Um, when when I checked in before I left, uh, the report was that we were about 66% done with the total uh, transfer work, uh, and that was before we tagged up with the crew at the end of the day. We have a normally planned tag up where the crew uh, briefs the ground on the progress made to date. So I would expect that uh, once they factor in that brief, we'll be right on the timeline. We've got a number of hours uh, scheduled on the timeline tomorrow before hatch close. Uh, in addition to the seizure work and transfer, uh, we also did a lot of work in the joint airlock. Uh, one of the things we have to do on every shuttle mission is to get the, um, the shuttle crews, EMUs or, or spacesuits ready for return on the orbiter. Uh, for this particular mission, um, Drew Foistel and Mike Fink are the designated astronauts that would perform a contingency spacewalk if one was required after undock. So one of the things we have to do toward the end of each of these missions is to prepare uh, their, their spacesuits for a return on the shuttle. And um, another technique that we use in order to change out new hardware, new spacesuit hardware on the station is that we scavenge um, shuttle crew members' suits. So for example, we had uh, uh, Foistel and Fink suits in the airlock today, and we, we took parts from their suits and installed those parts on suits that would stay on station. We in turn took older parts from the station suits, installed those on, on Foistel and Fink suits. So in the end, you have two complete functional EMUs or spacesuits uh, that will return on, on shuttle, uh, available for use if necessary, but they have the older parts still within CERT, still serviceable, but older parts return on the shuttle. The newer parts from the uh, shuttle astronauts uh, spacesuit stay on station. So at the end of the day, um, we had two good spacesuits for um, Foistel and Fink. Those will get transferred over to, to the shuttle. Um, in addition, as another get ahead, uh, looking ahead to SDS-135, where we talked uh, before about the fact that there will be a spacewalk on 135, but it will be performed by the increment crew, specifically uh, Mike Fossum and Ron Guerin. So one of the other things we did today, since we had the time and, and the uh, expertise available, is that we configured uh, the spacesuit that uh, Mike Fossum will use on the 135 uh, spacewalk. Uh, basically got it ready to go for that spacewalk. So, you know, really the, um, the theme of the day was maintenance on station and get aheads on the stage, kind of looking ahead to SDS-135. So another, uh, another uh, busy, productive day on station. Um, 
let's see, looking, looking ahead, we just wrapped up flight day 13. Flight day 14, the emphasis is on last minute transfer and transfer of payloads and, and other cargo that has to be done at the last minute um, for reasons driven by science or other things. And then uh, in the flight day 14, we do the hatch close. And then uh, finally, flight day 15, early in the day, we do undock. So with that, uh, Kelly, that concludes my part of the uh, overview. Thanks, Joe. We'll start here with questions in Houston. Uh, please uh, state your name and affiliation uh, before you question. Robert. Hi, Rob Perlman with CollectSpace.com with a couple of questions. Uh, regarding transfer, has a decision been made about bringing down the, um, uh, the EGF from the boom uh, inside Endeavor, or will it wait for STS-135? Yeah, that's a good question. The EFGF, which uh, for EVA-4, we decided not uh, to de defer the stowage of the EFGF in the tool stowage assembly. We made a decision that that would come down on STS-135 in the MPLM. And uh, with regards to um, the seizure repair, just before coming here, I heard that uh, they were running closer to their uh, pre-sleep and sleep schedule and might have to, might have to defer, uh, def delay finishing the task, uh, the, the repair. Um, if they can't get this done today and tomorrow, is that something that the state, that the expedition crew has to pick up immediately to complete, or can it wait um, and you have other systems to, to support that? Thanks. Yeah, we have a, a functional carbon dioxide removal assembly that's operating today in the lab module, and then we also have the Vosduk uh, system in the Russian segment. So we have those two separate ways to do carbon dioxide removal, and those two devices are capable of removing all the CO2 that we need to from station. So what the Note 3 CEDRA gives us is redu purely redundancy. So if we don't finish tomorrow, certainly Ron Guerin has a training to do it, um, but if he didn't have the time uh, between now and 135, we could also postpone it after 135. So no, no immediate urgency, but it's, it'd be nice to have that redundancy back. Okay, Denise? Uh, Denise Chow at space.com. Um, I know the decision was made early not to add an extra day, but with the uh, transfer work and the CEDRA, um, would an extra day have helped a lot with this mission? Um, I mean, there's always more to do. But looking at the timeline and the way it's laying out, we've gotten all the higher, high priority objectives that we wanted to get. Um, there's additional work that could have been done, but uh, we've already got a long mission you know, planned. Um, 16 days is, is a long mission in general. And then if you look at the potential for weather wave offs, it could get uh, longer after undock. So I'm really happy with, uh, with the way the timeline laid out. I'm really pleased with all the, all the work we got done and, and all the high priority objectives that are behind us. So I think, I think in retrospect, that was the right decision. Okay. Uh, seeing no other questions right here, let's go to our phone bridge. Uh, Bill Harwood. Uh, yeah, thanks, Derek. Just two quick ones for me. I, I, I've just missed this. Is it the desiccant bed or the absorbent bed that they're replacing? It's actually that it is that bed. They do both. So there, the there's, one... there's two of these desiccant absorbent beds in the carbon dioxide removal assembly, and they are replacing one of those two. Okay, I understand. Thank you. And the second one, and I just missed this earlier, too. Where did the, where did the OGS uh, maintenance end up? We actually completed that maintenance, so we installed the, the new hosing and the cartridge filter that's intended to uh, scrub the contaminants from the water line. When, once, the, once the crew finished that, we actually we turned on OGS and we did some pressure, delta pressure checks to make sure that we were getting the flow rates that we expected, and all of that's gone as expected. So that we finished out the OGS work and uh, the activation went well. The OGS is now available for oxygen production if we need it. Thanks. And again, back to Cedra, just, I'm just making sure I understand the innards of this thing. You have two beds, but each bed has a desiccant and an absorbent. Is that how that works? That's true, but it's all, it's, yeah, and I need to go verify this, but it's just, I believe it's all one unit, which we're taking out. All right, thanks. I appreciate it. You're oh, welcome. Okay. And I think we have Todd Halverson on as well. Todd, are you there? Well, we may have... uh, sure am. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Okay, Todd Halverson of Florida Today. Um, Derek, I was just wondering uh, what your thoughts are about um, the opportunity during the upcoming fly-around to see the International Space Station with uh, 
the U.S. portion at assembly complete. Thanks. Um, you know, the, the fly around photos are always spectacular, uh, just amazing views of the space station. And, you know, every time I see a, a picture from that perspective, it, it kind of, you know, it reminds you just everything we've accomplished over the past number of years. Um, and I don't know if you've seen them yet, but the, uh, the pictures that Greg Shamatoff took from the, from the top of ELC-3 with the fisheye lens are, are out there now, too. And, I mean, th those are some of the most amazing photographs I've, I've ever seen. So, you know, anytime you see something like that, uh, it just kind of makes you pause and, and appreciate uh, just everything that we've accomplished. And if I could follow that real quickly, um, I, I'm I'm wondering what your your thoughts are. You've been you've been with NASA, I think, since 1990, uh, uh, way back when, and you've been through this entire process of not only the uh, redesigns of space station, but the actual assembly of the um, massive uh, vehicle. And I, I'm wondering if um, you have any particular thoughts uh, now that you actually are at assembly complete. It's been a long time coming. It has been a long time coming. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of ups and downs, um, especially, I think I mentioned it before, but especially in the early 90s, you know, when, when it seemed like there was a cycle every two years of a, of a bottoms up redesign, um, you know, I, I, had, I had doubts that we'd ever get any, any hardware launch, quite honestly. So, you know, it, it was, um, it was an amazing thing just to be involved in the first, the first launch of U.S. hardware, STS-88. And, uh, and there was a period there from about 1998 to 2003 where we went from, you know, questions about the program even happening and congressional votes, you know, yearly about whether to cancel station. But then you look at what we accomplished from 1998 to 2002, 2003, you know, once we got the laboratory module launched. I mean, that, that was a period that I remember looking back on and just being amazed by how much we'd, we'd accomplished over that period. And then, you know, after that point, you know, unfortunately, it, or fortunately, I guess, it, it becomes somewhat cl like clockwork and routine. You know, we've got so many good people, so many qualified engineers, so many smart folks that are willing to work all the details that, um, you know, you just, uh, you pick the team, you plug them in, and they go off and do what it is that they're so good at doing. And that's, you know, one of the downsides of what we do is that ultimately, when you actually execute the mission, it all ends up looking so easy that people take it for granted. You know, and that goes from, from KSC to launching, or uh, to um, getting the shuttle ready to go, and then the actual launch to all the on-orbit operations, the rendezvous and docking, um, all the spacewalks, all the robotics. You know, these are things that, that 10, 15 years ago we, we hadn't thought about doing. And now, you know, we have four and five EVAs, um, multiple parallel activities going on inside. So it's just, um, you know, it's a tribute to really the people, both at, at uh, NASA centers all over the country and then to the, to the, um, the great crews that uh, fly with us as well. Thanks, Derek. That's all from me. Okay. Any further follow-ups back here in Houston? Seeing none, we'll uh, wrap up this briefing and thank everyone for com coming. Just a couple of programming notes. The, uh, the crews are starting to shift their schedules again, so the station crew sleep shift scheduled to begin at 10.26 a.m. today, and that's central time. Uh, and then the Endeavour crew sleep will begin half an hour later at 10.56 a.m. Uh, and then we'll have our International Space Station Flight Director update coming up at 3.45 p.m. this afternoon. So with that, uh, we'll uh, send you back to Mission Control and a reminder that those great photos, Derek, we're talking about are available on the NASA website at www.nasa.gov. Thanks for being here.